Hey up everybody, how's the study? Hope it's going well. I'm here to save you that time, make studying easier, and also increase those marks for you. Thanks for landing on this channel and hitting this video. If you've not been here before, my name is Professor Mark Egan and I work in the University of York specializing in teaching and learning innovation. Now today's video, we're gonna be focusing on referencing. I'm gonna be giving you the hints, the tips, and the strategies that are really gonna help you. This is the sort of stuff that I wish I'd known 20 years ago when I was studying. This is from my experience of seeing literally thousands of essays and I'm pulling together what I understand to be the best, the strong things which people are doing and also how we eradicate and get rid of the weak things as well. If you're watching this video today, I seriously suggest you also watch some of the videos here. They're also a big dealing with issues of referencing and also have a look at the videos here because they're also gonna be looking at Google Scholar and also giving you some hints and tips. Importantly, smash that like button, hit the subscribe. I'm gonna be releasing so much content and put together, it's really gonna equip you with the skills to get your marks up. Okay, so let's smash through these. Tip number one, when you're citing your sources in a list at the end, make sure that you don't call it a bibliography, instead call it a reference list. I've just been marking through, I've done about 100 scripts, and I would say of these first year essays, many of them are calling it a bibliography. It's a really bad habit. A reference list contains all of the works that has been cited in the brackets inside of your essay. Nothing more, nothing less. A bibliography, whereas, is a list maybe of all the things that you've read or things which have helped support you in the learning and the putting together of the essay. Now, nearly all of the formatting for referencing styles will all be asking for you to cite the works that you've used in the actual essay or assignment. They won't just be asking you to list everything that you've read. This may seem like a small, trifling, insignificant thing, but these things mount up. And throughout the whole of an essay, this sort of sloppy scholarship starts to get into the mind of the marker. When people are marking, very often they're looking for easy hooks, ways that they can quickly hang off a comment or write something corrective that they've seen. If you give them easy hooks that they can write a comment on, you're really making it easy for them to downgrade your essay. Therefore, get these simple things right and then you'll make it more difficult for them to downgrade it in terms of level of scholarship. Tip number two, is to use a reference management tool. When we're in the business of putting our references together, it can be a huge task. And also this is dependent on the size of the assignment, going from maybe a thousand words up to 10,000 words if you're doing a dissertation, and maybe 80,000 words if you're doing a PhD. So one of the key things then is management of all of these sources. If we don't do this, and I was guilty of this myself, our sources and our references end up being erratically everywhere on different pages, across our documents, and we start to allow errors to come into our coordination of our references. It's ultimately a virtual library. It allows you to collect together all of the different sources that you've used. You're not having them put over several documents that you then have to go looking for at the end. Instead, you have to see this as a process that you're doing throughout and not something you do just at the end when you're looking to compile the list. There's all different sorts of management tools out there on the market and it's for you to find your preferences and understand which one works for you. When we get to the end of these tips, I'll be telling you what I think is the number one reference management tool. Now the third tip I have for you, I think is a really important one and this can really help you gain the marks and impress the people who are marking your paper. So tip number three, is how you increase the number of sources in your reference list. So very often then when we're going about referencing, we might just be using a single author in the parathesis brackets and that will be it. That's all we'll be citing in text. Now this little tip helps you think about how maybe you can gather together a series of scholarships to cite at the same time. Now we do this when we're writing about a certain idea, maybe a certain theory or a certain concept or maybe a certain position that a number of academics might have in that field. Now if they are sharing that same position or they're working in the same aligning in the same understanding of the theory then we can cite them together as multiple sources it can allow us to get 
two, three, four sources out, particularly at the beginning of our paragraphs, and therefore we might be addressing a specific theory, concept, argument, and understanding, and we can get out several sources at the start. Now, importantly as well, when we think about sources, we are led to believe that sources are also about what we've read, and that we have to go about the business of printing these off, looking at the PDF documents, reading through them all, and understanding them. But it's not an exam. It's actually testing how well you can write. Perhaps then, all of these sources that you're citing, what you're doing is you're demonstrating an awareness of the field, an awareness of scholars, academics, professors who have published and who are talking together and having a conversation and a dialogue and are aligned in their thoughts. And this is a really important thing to demonstrate. It's what academics do all the time in their articles and it's something you can do in your assignment to really up your scholarship game and demonstrate that you're worthy of the higher marks in how you comprehend a new sources. Now it's not like you've read them all or even understand what they're all saying. You're just pitching out there at the beginning as you group these multiple sources together that there's an awareness in the field and you're saying this to the reader. Now moving on to tip number four. This is about how we get the perfect reference list. It's basically going onto Google Scholar and using a certain function called Cite. It will show you the correct formatting of how you reference the source that you've gone into. And you'll have a choice of several different ways to format your citation. You have to find out your department and see which formatting style that they use. It could be Harvard perhaps, and therefore you would use that source. Now all you have to do is then copy and paste that over onto your Word document or save that over into your reference management tool. And therefore you've got the complete correct reference. There's no mistakes going to be made. So tip number five is using Microsoft Word to put it into alphabetical order. This is a simple one. Now, I never knew this. And when I was writing essays, I would go through the, the lengthy task of sorting and shifting. You don't have to do this. Microsoft Word will do it automatically and list all of your referencing into alphabetical order. You'd be surprised how many of these reference lists I see at the end, which will have sloppy mistakes where they aren't in the correct order. This will get rid of that. Tip number six is use the module sources. This is really important. Do you know sometimes it's the first thing I go to, I'll be wanting to know if they've used any references, which is part of the module material. Very often the module sources that you've been given are the best in the field. They've been coordinated by an academic, a professor who knows the field. And so find ways to use some of those sources. Importantly, the module leader also wants to see that you are engaging with the module. The mistake is, when you go completely off at a tangent and you start gathering your own sources using Google, you'll end up compiling your essay with maybe lots of sources, but they might be completely alien to the module and of no knowledge to the person who's marking it. If you're marking an essay and you recognize very few of the sources, you start to have concerns over that piece of work. Another thing, lecturers have an ego. They've put together these modules, perhaps they've cited their own work and therefore engage with that show that you've been listening to them, show that you've been turning up, really sometimes playing the ego game, buttering up to them and showing that you're engaged with it is really important. It can be really detrimental to your marks if you just veer off, go off piste on a tangent and you end up compiling your source and your citations with things which are completely irrelevant and from another kind of field to what you've actually been writing on. One of the issues sometimes I get with people, with students, is they might start referring to first year work, they might start referring too much to work from other modules. Try and look at the reading list, look at the slides, look at the lecture content, look at what's been provided by the module leader, the professor, and try to use this. Finally, another reason why I'm telling you about the strategy is professors are seeing more and more commission pieces of work. Now, if somebody's asked someone to write their work, maybe they've gone to an essay mill and they've given their essay title and they've said, I want you to write me an essay on this. Now, the person who writes it probably isn't gonna have access to the very module-specific reading and lectures. So the chances are what is produced at the end will be something that won't contain, or will contain very few, of the references that have been 
been used. Very often in my modules, I'll cite specific things in the reading list, which I know will probably be outside of the reach or the gathering of all these people who are working in the essay mills. So what happens when I see an essay, and very often the sources are completely different to what the modules provided, I start to think maybe it's been commissioned. And it might be the case that I'll put it forward to look at an academic scrutiny panel and see if it's actually been commissioned and the student might get interviewed for this. Moving on to tip number seven, and this is using a referencing cheat sheet. They lend themselves to providing you with the basic formatting styles that you will be using. So if you're using the APA formatting style for your referencing, then the cheat sheet will literally list down all the different sources that you might have, different media content, videos online, a film perhaps, a magazine, a news article, a web source, journals, books, and they will show you the various ways that you could reference using these different sources. A very useful device for having next to you on your document and glancing over it and checking. Tip number eight, this is looking at the formatting, the size, the font that you're using, also hanging the ident of your reference reference list. One of the issues when you go to the reference list at the end is seeing silly mistakes. Very often there's an inconsistency if there's maybe 20 to 30 sources that they haven't all been formatted correctly. And this is all about giving signals out to the person that's marking it that someone cares, that you're gunning for the top marks. And it hasn't just been compiled in a slapdash, hurried fashion. So here we are already at tip number nine. And this one is to check, check, check. It is so important through the whole of an essay, but particularly because of references and how fine and detailed, and let's face it, sometimes mind normally boring they are to compile, that we go through and we check that we were consistent, that we've got all these little particular parts correct, and that the styles are correct, and the formatting is correct. Make sure it's all there. Now this leads me on to tip number 10, which I'm the biggest fan of in terms of helping us alleviate mistakes and saving us time. Now there's some really big benefits of using Google Scholar, and I can't implore you enough to use it. You will see transformations in your writing techniques, in your data management, and also in your marks if you get to grips, if you put the time in and you learn how to use Google Scholar efficiently and properly. But aside from that, we're thinking about how can it help us with our reference lists and one of the ways is Google Scholar helps us collect correlate and store the sources we've been using and it allows us to do that in various ways now if you want more detail on this I really suggest you go to the videos that I've given the overviews of Google Scholar and also the hints and the tips some of the most dramatic improvements that I see with my students work is when they start implementing a really coherent strategy of using Google Scholar I will consider it the most rigorous and systematic way of coordinating your reference strategy. So really get to grips with it, get on it and start using it. It will really help you. I really want you to hit the subscribe button. It's really important for me and for you. It's about building up a general knowledge of your academic skills. You can come in and out and watch one video for 10 minutes, but it's really not gonna make that much difference. You've gotta watch these things consecutively, build up that knowledge base and improve and improve. And all of a sudden you'll find that you've got a whole system of understanding how to do a coordinated way of writing a better essay. Get with us on this journey and hit that subscribe button and keep watching this channel. I'm not gonna let you down. I'm here to improve your marks. Goodbye for now. You take care of yourself. Keep studying hard. And most importantly, study smart and we'll see the results. Bye bye.